it's been a while. It is now into uh, September, close to October of 2023. As always, I have a really special guest with me. I've got Sylvia Escobar. And Sylvia is uh, born and raised in Rio Grande Valley in Texas. She has a BS in biology and MS in computer science. And we've got a couple things in common there, especially the biology degree. And she's got her educational leadership uh, degree as well. And she's working on a doctorate. Boy, you just don't seem to stop with the education. Uh, I'm going to let Sylvia kind of introduce all of her other background and job titles because she, it seems, Sylvia, like you just keep on moving forward, which is uh, an amazing thing. I think you've, you've, we've always got to, <laughs> don't we, in education, right. um, or we just end up kind of stagnating. Uh, right. But uh, let me just start off with, first of all, welcome. Glad to have you as one of my guests this year. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. Yes, and we're kind of far away. I drove through Texas this year, so it was very hot, I can tell you that. And it probably <laughs> took you forever to drive through it. <laughs> yes. So let's start off with, I, I just can't wait to talk about you and your background here. So we'll start off with just our fun question of the day, which is, uh, what's your favorite coffee if you're a coffee drinker? I am. So I drink a cup of coffee every single morning and sometimes uh, in the afternoon if I need one. I'm actually a basic coffee girl. So I just, I'm, I'm a just, I, my favorite is Dunkin' Donuts, uh, regular coffee, regular cream, regular sugar. I don't, I don't take any of the, you know, uh, sugar, fancy sugar things, just regular. Uh, sometimes I'll have a cafe mocha at Starbucks. And then of course I have my own just, uh, the the gourmet uh coffee shop that's all i do with uh so just plain coffee i'm a plain coffee girl uh it sounds good it sounds good so you know i was going to read off kind of your background but it was it's pretty extensive and i think it kind of plays better if you just kind of tell the your your kind of narrative of your story of education i mentioned that both of us started off as biology majors and for me again as much as I love the kind of animal sciences, I didn't really find a, a niche there and, and again, wound my way to education. So I'm really interested. So maybe let's, we can start even before then if you'd like, but uh, yeah. let's start with that. Okay, so good. So um, first of all, both of my parents, my wonderful parents, I had a great family, by the way, I was the youngest of five, uh, all educated except for one who didn't complete college, but she was the street smarts one, so it was okay. Uh, my parents were also educated, which here in the Rio Grande Valley, we're at the southern tip of Texas, deep south Texas, uh, by the Mexico border. And the fact that just my parents both completed uh, college was just, you know, I'm, I wasn't, I'm a second generation college goer. So uh, my father was a pharmacist. He owned a pharmacy and my mother was a registered nurse. So they were both in medicine. So naturally, um, being the youngest, I wanted to be a doctor. Um, they groomed me practically for it. Uh, yeah, I worked in my dad's pharmacy since I was like five years old. They had me counting money and, and um, uh, you know, uh, dusting the medication and stuff like that. And so my whole life, that was actually my second home was the pharmacy since both of my parents worked there when I was, when I was a child. Um, so they would pick me up from school and that's where I would be. Um, so I was brought around that. So I wanted to do medicine. I, I practiced here at home. Uh, and, and this was my childhood home, by the way. So I practiced here, um, as a doctor and everything, um, giving out dispensing M&Ms and I don't know, my dad used to give me his old prescription pads and although, you know, he voided them, but I would write things out. So, uh, when I went to the university, I went to Trinity university in San Antonio and I was pre-med. So that was, you know, why I majored in biology, even though my strongest, uh, subject has always been math. I was very uh, mathematically inclined since a young age, but I thought, I, you know, I'm going to go medicine. I need to go biology. Um, and medical school didn't pan out for me. I, I for whatever reason, um, me, I felt like I was an aggressive, aggressive enough to get into it. So um, I came back home and started to pursue a, a master's in biology. And soon I, I figured out that wasn't for me. Uh, like I told you, my whole background was in animal science and human science. And then the program that was here was all plant biology. So that didn't work out. So I needed a job 
And uh, there was a teaching position, a math teaching position, middle school open. And at that time I could get a teaching position which is um, emergency certification. So that's what I did. And then they gave me two years to get my teaching certification. So I did in mathematics, uh, that's my six through 12 mathematics is, is what my, uh, my, my uh, certification is in. Uh, during that time, I'm, I'm never settled. I, I'm always uh, wanting to keep on going. So I decided to go for my master's um, in computer science. So I switched over because I've always loved, again, mathematics, logic, um, computer science, technology. So I went into that and uh, I finished, I completed my master's in, in computer science, but I suffered from um, not having the proper self-efficacy. I was always two female. There was only two females in a class of like 40. Um, I, I felt like I couldn't compete with the males in industry. So I ended up uh, going into education, staying in education instead of going, pursuing my computer science uh, master's in industry. So uh, I went and got my principalship another master's in educational leadership. I was a principal for uh, four years and then an assistant principal for one year. And that's where I started my journey on STEM education because I was a director or principal of a school within a school, which was a STEM early college high school. And so that's what started me on that journey. Um, uh, when I was an assistant principal, it was assistant principal of STEM education at that campus. And then I moved over to region one uh, where I've been there for almost nine years, nine years actually in October. And I, I was a STEM specialist and I just recently was moved to instructional technology coordinator, which I still oversee the STEM department. But in addition, I see instructional technology and e-learning departments. Uh, I'm also now getting my, my doctorate. I'm on my dissertation and um, focusing on gender equity in computer science. I wanted to to pursue that um, since I feel like that was my downfall when I was younger and uh, and working on, on that at Texas a and Kingsville. So hopefully I'll be done Ho shooting for December. Not sure about that, um, but I'm working on that. And so that's, that's where I am right now. And I'm blessed to be in a position at a regional center here in the state of Texas where I can now influence um, STEM education at a lot of different districts and a lot of campuses. And um, I work with teachers in mainly in, in anything STEM. So project-based learning, engineering, computer science, uh, robotics. And so I, I get to do the fun stuff, but I'm training teachers and hopefully um, those teachers are then working with their kids and I'm having a bigger influence in my position that I am at now. You know, it's really fascinating. I think we have a lot of kind of similarities beyond just biology. Uh, you know, I too had, uh, my father was a surgeon, mother was a nurse, and there was that really strong medical, uh, you know, uh, not that that necessarily was a push for my parents, but it was certainly, you know, around the house, around the dinner table, it was talking about medicine and healthcare and that sort of thing. So you kind of uh, became used to that, the jargon and the conversation and that sort of thing. But then uh, when I actually went into, you know, college and that sort of thing, I kind of thought, hmm, you know, maybe this isn't what I'm really looking forward to. I kind of gravitated to other things and again, found my way to teaching. So interesting kind of uh, pieces there. But I also think, and I think it's an interesting one, is that your parents seemed like they were very uh, pro-education. Uh, education was an expectation, was something that was very strongly encouraged and, uh, you know, you didn't want to come home with uh, anything less than a B. <laughs> right, far. right. And, and, and you know, being as, you know, I'm Hispanic female, again, here in deep South Texas, um, that was, I, I just was really lucky, really lucky because I don't know, a lot of my peers didn't have that um, support and, and push on education. Definitely my, my family is half medical, half education. We had a lot of teachers, uh, my aunts and uncles, you know, are, we have a lot of uh, people in education. So my, my parents were very happy that I ended up, you know, they were accepting that I didn't go into medicine. Um, but what's interesting also, something that you mentioned um, is that in STEM education, you know, research shows us that role models and mentors are really, really important in STEM education. And that's what I had. They definitely didn't push me into it. It was just that that's what I was around. That's what I knew. Uh, my, both my parents were 
you know, liked what they did. And so that, that influenced just the way I thought, um, even though I, I ended up not going into that, I was stayed in education, but you know, who knows, um, like maybe I still, still can go and do something in, in medicine, but, but that influ that, that mentorship and it was there for me. And so that, that, that's what research shows us is something that's really important to STEM education. You know, I've been kind of dying to ask this question and it just occurred to me, uh, you'd be the perfect person to kind of ask this question. So I've had just very brief experiences uh, going to Texas, Texas, uh, San Antonio a couple times and then kind of traveling through, you know, just recently. Um, but I've always found, and again, I'm, I'm speaking more of San Antonio. I felt like there was a really nice community there. I, it felt very safe and very comfortable. And I, I love the kind of uh, interplay between the cultures of, you know, uh, of, of Mexican, Spanish, you know, American. I mean, it just seemed like a nice blend of 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 harmony there do you find that from a maybe native texan and um maybe how does that also carry over to schools and education do you feel there's a community do you feel there's cohesion uh tell me about maybe just a, a bigger picture of of texas education so um absolutely so first of all texas uh is a very friendly state i mean you, anytime people come and visit they're like oh do you, i love the people in texas they're so friendly uh, san antonio is definitely uh so san antonio is three and a half hours uh, uh north of me but it's definitely hispanic heavily hispanic population there in the rio grande valley we're about 90 95 percent hispanic uh, about 80% economically disadvantaged. So we have a very, it's interesting because as far as the state's concerned, uh, they tend to look a lot at the achievement that's going on here in the Rio Grande Valley because we have the populations that everybody to everybody with those populations says, no, you know, they're not going to do well, but yet we still do well here. And I think the reason is because, um, because I mean, we have a, a, the, the culture that's here. It's, a, you know, there's not a lot of... Hispanic is the majority and, and economically disadvantaged is the majority. So everybody's kind of in the same boat and they do pull each other. There is a, a great sense of community, um, a, a great sense of support. Uh, also, I, I had a friend who uh, came from West Texas where it's it's not as, you know, Hispanic is, is a minority. And he told me, and this stuck with me, he told me that when he came down to the Valley, that he wasn't used to seeing uh, heads and heads of the community, leaders of the community who were also Hispanic. You know, he was he was coming from a place in Texas where mainly it was uh, white Anglo who were the mayors and the commissioners and the leaders of the society. But here in the Valley, it's the opposite. So growing up, you know, I even, uh, you know, I talk about my parents being those role models, but just in general in the community, the Hispanic community has very strong Hispanic role models here in the Valley. And you see it everywhere. You see it on the billboards, you see it uh, on the news. I mean, our newscasters are mainly Hispanic, our, our you know, if people who are speaking. So I think that makes it a lot different um, because, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of kids in the valley feel like they can do it. The problem is whether or not they have the opportunities to do it. But it definitely is friendly. Um, you know, there's a a great support system. The family, the Hispanic family support system, is very nurturing and caring. Um, uh, of course, you know, do you also have a lot of Hispanic parents who feel like you know, their, their kids um, don't, shouldn't go to school, that they need to work and they need to help support younger siblings. So you also have that mentality, but as at the most part, you know, it's just Texas in general is a great place to be. Um, I know I work with a lot of people. At, so Texas is divided into 20 educational service centers. We're region one. Uh, some of the bigger ones in be, the bigger cities, I've worked with a lot of people there and they're just everybody all around is just very helpful, very, um, very community based, very much supporting each other. And like what we're doing with STEM education, you know, I can easily call somebody from Dallas region 10 or Fort Worth region 11 or Austin region 13 and, and uh, talk to somebody about, you know, what are you doing? Can you share what resources you have? And that's what we do. So for us, you know, it's about 
it's about uh, the students are the motto, the motto at region one is students first. And that really is big in our educational system. It's about the students and student achievement and students having opportunities to, to move on and to do well by their families, support their families. And so I think that is just the overarching idea in the state of Texas. And we, we try to achieve it as much as we can here in the Valley. We have, again, great all most teachers are Hispanic. That's another issue that happens up north. You know, we're like, I've heard that too. Like, oh, we have Hispanic students, but we don't have teachers who are Hispanic who are teaching them. That's not the case here. Almost, you know, 90% of the kids are Hispanic. So are the teachers, 90% of the teachers. So they have great role models. And, and it's just, it's, it's, a, it's different here. It's different here. So we're able to, to, uh, kids are high achieving, um, even though they are on a, on the border. And, um, you know, a lot, some of them still live in Mexico. Some of them go home to Mexico during in the, on the weekend, their grandparents are there and, uh, and there's a lot of adversity, but our kids are still able to manage to achieve well. Well, you've talked about, you know, role models several times. And I, I mean, I think you're, you're a living role model right, right here because you've done so much and you've, um, I think you know, you've displayed a lot of perseverance and uh, grit to, you know, get to kind of where you are and you, you're you almost at your doctorate. So um, you. a lot to be proud of, but also I think, again, you're, you're, you're walking the walk as well as talking the talk, which is, I think, a really fantastic um, inspiration. So with that in mind, um, what are your kind of goals as you as you get your doctorate and you're you're looking to move in education and it seems like you've you haven't stayed in one place for long so what are some of your kind of future endeavors that you're you're thinking of or or what are some big ideas in education you'd like to kind of push forward as you uh, kind of go up in the leadership uh, ladder right well um so and i am one who kind of gets you know i don't want to say i get bored every four years but kind of but what's great in I've stayed at region one for a while because I work in STEM education. It seems like every year it's different. Like every year there's a new initiative. Uh, every year there's some new technology that's coming out in play. You know, right now it's all about, e we're doing a lot of uh, initiatives with esports and artificial intelligence. Like That's like the biggest thing right now. And so because every year is different, I feel like my job is also fresh every year. Um, I also have you know, they, they give me enough flexibility that if I have an initiative or an idea, I can run with it. Um, and so that has been really great. So I, I actually, um, I have, I think, four, four and a half years before I can retire. Um, I, I'm very happy where I'm at with Region 1. Beyond that, though, and what I'm trying to do with my, my doctorate is uh, definitely um, hitting that the, you know, there, there are a lot of gaps in STEM education with gender uh, and also students with exceptionalities, you know, students who have disabilities aren't usually given the opportunities to do STEM education, but it really truly should be for all. And I think that's my biggest message, whether, whether you're female, whether you're, you know, whether you haven't passed the state exam yet, uh, whether you are a student, you know, on the spectrum or whatever, every student should have opportunities in STEM education and should be able to, to do, to, to do hands-on projects, you know, that are, that are fun, but are also teaching really great content. It's all about application of what kids are learning in the classroom. And I think that's really my biggest message. I want to be able to talk about it as much as I can, you know, try and train teachers, um, provide uh, that mindset that they need to be risky in education and they need to, to provide this opportunity for all students. Um, it's not fair that it's just for students who are high achievers or for as an after school program. It really needs to be for all. Um, I had a student some time ago when I was assistant principal and he was in a geometry class and he had been giving the teacher some issues and I brought him out, uh, you know, teacher didn't want him in the class. So uh, I brought him into my office and I was trying to get down to the bottom of why that student was acting up so much in this teacher's class. And he said to me, he said, you know, I don't need this, you know, I don't need to learn this math. Like, what do I need this math for? And yeah, out of all the maths, geometry is the one that you're going to use your whole life. Like if you're going to build a house or 
put up a fence or what have you. And, you know, it's, it's just, we're not, we're not properly teaching students the application of what they're learning in the classroom. They're learning a lot of things, but they don't see the point. They don't see the connection of what they're going to see in the real world. And I think that's what STEM education drives is that application uh, that need to know, you know, I need to know this content because if not, I'm not going to be able to do this project that I need to do. And also, you know, a lot of soft skills, um, the state is calling them STEM fluency skills, like, like you said, perseverance and grit and, and uh, time management. And I think those are all skills that our students need to learn and all students need to be able to learn them. So I, I think most of all, that is my biggest message is that um, something like STEM education should be available for all students and that opportunity should be provided to them. And, you know, hopefully it's, it's about, um, after, you know, after Region 1, I don't know, co consulting or I've always wanted to um, help start a school, like, you know, help start a true STEM school with that does project-based learning 100% of the time. Uh, I would love to to help that, um, but definitely, definitely continue with STEM education. I mean, that's where my heart is, and I just want to continue the message and help, help teachers, help schools uh, provide those opportunities for all students. Well, it sounds like you've got a lot, uh, a lot to do. <laughs> Better keep rolling up your sleeves. Absolutely. So I don't, I don't have any children. I don't have any grandchildren. There's no reason for me to slow down at all, um, other than some traveling. So no, I, I, I plan on continuing as long as I can. Well, it sounds like you've got, uh, uh, quite a few children that you've been <laughs> a part of their lives, uh, which is a great thing. Um, Maybe we'll wind it up here on on this question, and it's a probably a big one. But um, what are some trends maybe you're following that you think are going to take on? I know around here in, in New York State, it's everyone's talking about AI, or at least there was a buzz about it. Um, but are there others that maybe you're following in STEM, or um, what's your thoughts? So um, it, it does, I mean, I think it does leverage a lot on technology and the new technology and, and definitely um, artificial intelligence is really huge. But for me, that the new advancements in technology is what is going to influence education. Um, I feel that, I feel that education needs to get with the 22nd um, century, right? Like it needs to, it needs to be a more advanced. During COVID, a lot of teachers were forced to use things like Google Classroom and things like that. But now that we've gone face to face, they moved away from it again. But something like artificial intelligence, you know, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of fear in the education realm right now with it. For teachers, it's a game changer because it's going to make things so much more efficient. Like I use uh, ChatGPT to write emails, like an email that I would have had to you know, written, like took, take me an hour to write. Now it's five minutes. Uh, teachers can use it for lesson planning. They can use it to write exams that are um, differentiated for different student populations based on the standards. Like, I mean, really, it's amazing. Um, there's also some new AI, um, kind of like TAs. Like I tell teachers, wouldn't you love to have your own teacher's assistant that is an AI that grades for you, does all the mundane routine, team things that you have to spend time with so that you can then focus on individual students, individual groups of students, and really give them that time and that one-to-one -one education. So as far as teachers, I think that it is going to be really a great tool that they can use to help them really um, hone in on one-to-one, on -one, more individualized learning. On the student side, that's where the fear comes in play. They're like, you know, students are going to cheat. They're going to, how do I know if they can write? How do I know if they can do this? But I'm not so worried about that. I think that, um, I think that some, so like, think about the calculator, right? Right. When the calculator came into play, people were, were probably like, oh my goodness, you know, nobody's going to know how to add anymore. And to some extent, I mean, I, you know, I know how to add, but I still use a calculator because it just makes things more efficient. Um, I think that's what's headed. Like, you know, we, we have to teach differently. Um, my message on that is that um, now we need STEM education more than anything. We need PBL more than anything. We can't teach kids facts. Why am I teaching them 
I'm, I'm going to anger somebody, sorry, social studies, but why am I teaching them the year of this war and when it was fought um, when I can just ask Google to give me that, that information? But what we really need to do is teach kids computer ethics and we need to teach them how to wield this new tool that they have. Like, do they know how to gather all this information from AI and the internet but put it together towards some problem that's plaguing our society, you know, put it to good use. Do they know that now it's really the, uh, we're talking about analysis and synthesis of information using all these tools. So yes, technology advancement, you know, soon we, we have AI and we have robots. The next thing is we're going to have a robot that is all AI and it's going to be right here sitting next to me. And it's going to be, you know, it's going to do a lot of things that, are mundane that I'm having to do on a daily basis at work, freeing me up to do other things. And, you know, a lot of people say, oh, it's going to, it's going to hurt creativity. I don't think so. A person who has that creative streak is always going to have creativity. It's just a tool. It's a new tool. It's going to think make things more efficient, but education has to change so that students now don't know what to do with that power um, what to do for the, for the good side also, like not the dark side, right? Like they need to wield it. They need to have ethics behind them so that they know what to do with it and how to use it wisely and to, to solve these really big problems that we have in the world and use it for good. So I'm excited about all this buzz stuff because I feel like it's going to have to revolutionize education. I, I think that education is just going to it's going to force our hand and things are going to have to change. Wow. Great answer. <laughs> yeah, hopefully I'm not like too, like, no, no. I'm like fired because I'm like, that one out of the, too, out of the park. She's too, uh, she's too, uh, what liberal or whatever in her way of <laughs> education or whatever. Anyway. Okay. No, I think you did a great job with it. And I think, you know, I think, a lot of times when new technologies or new trends come on the line, there's there's always going to be kind of a fear factor there. And it's a, a matter of understanding. And that's where I think um, and I know from from teachers that often there's there's a little res, reticence because teachers are so busy, you know, they're, especially when they're in the heart of a school year. It's always difficult to, you know, even take some time to read a book during the year. You're just going, going, going. And, and and so sometimes you just don't have the time to maybe take a deep dive into some of the, uh, you know, technologies that that we get to maybe unwrap a little bit sooner. But um, all right, well, we've got some speed gate questions for you. So these are okay. intended to be kind of quick, short answer okay. and to the point and maybe even some fun. So we were chatting a little bit before. So I got a little bit of a handle that you're kind of a you're on the whimsical and a gamer side, so let's go with there. What's your what's your whimsy? Is it Star Wars, Star Trek, Harry Potter? What are your what's your whimsy? So mine is definitely Harry Potter. Um, however, one of my sisters was Star Wars, and one of my sisters was Star Trek. So I love all three, uh, <laughs> nice. always well rounded. Um, but, but for me, it, it's definitely I, I've read all the Harry Potter books multiple times and the movies. I've been a big Harry Potter fan. Yeah, I you know I don't know if you were a teacher during the Harry Potter when it first came out, but I I I hate to think of it, but I wonder if it's like the last big wave of children's literature that just captured the entire world really on fire. It was it was a magical time in more ways than one with Harry Potter. I know as a teacher, I was right in the thick of an elementary teaching, and when it came online, and it was just so fun to it kind of brought adults and kids together and uh, it was really uh, magic. Yeah. Yep. You have to give JK <laughs> Rowling credit for that. So um, let's talk about, we'll kind of stick with that. You said you're a gamer in your bio. So which, what's your game? What kind of games are you playing? So um, I've been playing games since I was really young. Uh, my, my dad got a computer at the, the office uh and we my first game was marble madness which was crazy my sister and i were, my oldest sister and i would game um, we played all the king's quests mist um all kinds of different games uh then i played diablo for a while and then i did a korean game called rush on seven episodes and then um world of warcraft 
So World of Warcraft, I actually was a, a tank and a guild officer for about eight, nine years. I would raid on a regular oh. basis. So I was very much into that. Um, it was my social club also. That's what I would call it. Uh, I had to retire from it because <laughs> it was getting in the way of work and, and things like that. But, you know, I still have a fondness for it. Now I just... And now I just do like, uh, you know, I'll, I'll play some of the new esports games like Rocket League and Super Smash Brothers and things like that, just so I could see what the, the kids are playing. But, I, um, you know, World of Warcraft was my game. That was the one. Wow. Wow. That, that, that's incredible. I had a lot of teacher friends that played World of Warcraft. I mean, especially a little more on the innovative side, but they really loved it. And I knew that if I went into World of Warcraft, I'd never get out <laughs> yeah, so yeah i never i never quite captured it i just i i did test it out a few times and did the freebie version of it but i said i just can't if, if i go into it i'm gonna be stuck <laughs> so. and I, you know I, my, my character's still active right and she still has all her gear and uh, you know she's not the highest level anymore but uh, i've been tempted I, the problem with me is i don't have a good gaming computer but who knows? Maybe in the next year I'll get back on it, but still. There active. you go. All right. One more. Let's see. Uh, what's your favorite social network? So, I mean, I've always done, I, I mean, I've done Facebook for personal, you know, I've done, I do Twitter for work. So anytime we have an event or something, so I, I only do Twitter for event uh, for work and when I'm following different people, but I have been trying Snapchat lately. Um okay it's something new for me. And I'm like, well, okay. Yeah. I, I, I didn't like it at first. And I'm like, you know what, let me, let me try, let me try Snapchat a bit. So I've been working with that, but really, I, I, I mean, you know, more, more family wise, I do Facebook and I, I also, I'm, I'm an avid um, animal lover. And so, uh, you know, I follow a lot of local rescues. I mean, for me, that's what social networking is such so good at is getting that word out for a cause. And, and, you know, you have lost animals and they post them on social network and then other people network them. And then hopefully they're reunited with their, with their families. Um, so that's something that I, I really enjoy with social media is that aspect of it. Like, you know, reunite, trying to reunite fa uh, animals, uh, trying to help animals, stray animals and things like that. That's, that's what I like using it for. So, yeah. I love that. I love how you kind of, you know, came out of a positive because I know social media gets, you know, a lot of the kind of the black hat treatment, you know, uh, it's, it's terrible. It's terrible. It's terrible, but there's some really great stuff. And I loved how you highlighted uh, the animal piece to that. And I've, I've seen that too on Instagram. There's a lot of like animal rescues and it's just heartwarming to see people, um, you know, lend a hand <laughs> to uh, an animal that's struggling. And, uh, really? and that's, you know. that's a great, you know, that's, a, that's the way to get information out. And when you need to get information out about something that's happening, you know, uh, to some animals or whatever, I've been following one, there's, you know, there's one, unfortunately, it was, a, it was a hoarding case of, uh, of, a. Uh, uh, some local rescues gave some of their disabled dogs to uh, a lady who uh, is a hoarding case, but it's, it's just came out like last week, but I mean, just everything that's come out of it, you know, um, they're trying to get their dogs back and everything and following all that, you know, but there's a lot of people who are supporting it, but the information is going out through social media. They wouldn't have been, have been able to do that through the news or through the paper or whatever other way to do it. It's social media that is, is, ultimately going to help this situation. And that's where I, I like to see it used for good um, to spread that information. And me, I'm an animal lover, so I like that. Yeah, great. Well, Sylvia, it was a real pleasure meeting you. Um, stay stay warm <laughs> or stay cool, I guess. Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> it's still like 100 degrees here, so. <laughs> well, we're about to hit winter here, so we'll we'll take some of that heat, but. Uh, it was great meeting you. Great chatting with you. You're a real inspiration. I'm looking forward to when you uh, write a write a book about all your experiences because I think there's a lot of good stuff there. Hey, well, thank you so much. I appreciate um, I appreciate this and this opportunity to to talk about STEM education, which is really my passion. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Take care, and we'll, we'll keep up with you soon. All right. Thanks.